generell keinen optimistischen I have no optimistic impression that I can bring you from this conversation with President Putin. We are facing a lot of uncertainty. We're facing uh, rocky waters right now. The Fed funds rate. It's a very brute force kind of hammer that we use on the economy. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacqua. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London, standing in for Francine Lacqua. Here's what's coming up on today's program. It's U.S. Inflation Day. Stocks and bonds sell off with the 10-year Treasury yield at the highest since 2018. Shanghai in crisis. The U.S. pulls out non-essential consulate staff amid widespread COVID lockdowns. Plus, pessimistic about peace. The Austrian chancellor warns of a spiral of violence in Ukraine's east after meeting Vladimir Putin in Moscow. Well, happy Tuesday. Let's check in on markets. And it continues to be one of pain in this global bond market. U.S. CPI on dock. You also have an ECB meeting later this week where we're expected a path towards normalization, not to mention a monster Amazon bond sell plus mortgage rates moving higher, making it difficult to refinance. All of that means we are selling treasuries and indeed German and UK bonds this morning. So you're looking at a move higher of about 4.8 basis points on your 10-year yield. 2.82% is where that stands. German bond yield for the 10-year 2015 high UK 10-year yield. That's up another five basis points as well. And all of that translating into pain in the equity market as well. Here's your map of Europe just right across the board. The one that's doing a little bit better perhaps are UK stocks. FTSE 100 down only seven tenths of a percent. Compare that to the DAX down one and a half percent. We are seeing higher oil prices today, so that energy complex might be aiding the UK a bit here. Uh, Cacaron notable, it gained yesterday after the first round of the French elections. That is undoing at this moment, down 1.4 percent. Now, I mentioned the DAX, one of the worst performing regions. Part of that is the individual bank story. Both Deutsche Bank and Commerce Bank falling pretty heavily in today's session. Deutsche Bank down 10 percent. Commerce Bank 8.8 percent. There's one, an insider, someone who owned these stocks, selling about $2 billion worth of both Deutsche Bank and Commerce Bank, about $1.5 billion of Deutsche Bank and a half billion dollars of Commerce Bank. We don't know who it is, but we do know that the selling has been heavy. So that's your look at markets. But of course, all of these really dictated on the report we're going to get later today, and that's, of course, the U.S. CPI report for March. Now, that's expected to cement the view of top Fed officials that aggressive rate hikes are needed to fight inflation, which is at a 40-year high. Fed officials saying it will be hard to avoid some economic damage. We do not have a policy rule for every segment of the population. We don't have one for every industry. We have one. It's called the interest rate, the Fed funds rate. That's really it. So it's a very brute force kind of hammer that we use on the economy. And of course, when you kind of have to use a brute force tool, sometimes there's some collateral damage that happens. But we're trying to do this in a way that there's not much of it. But we can't tailor policy. We're joined now by Bloomberg's market editor, Christine Aquino, and Sandra Flippin, chief economist at ABN AMRO. Um, let me start with you, Sandra, and this language we're hearing out of the Fed. Uh, Waller there saying that, you know, it's not a perfect tool. It's a blunt force tool. Uh, how does this, how do, what do you make of this change in tone from the Fed going from talking about, you know, we're doing everything we can for a soft landing to, okay, perhaps some economic damage is inevitable? Yeah, well, I guess it is inevitable. And um, uh, what, what Waller calls collateral damage uh, will, uh, I guess, be the uh, American consumer uh, who is squeezed between, on the one, on the one hand, um, massive inflation and, on the other hand, uh, rate increases. So that's the collateral damage that we're talking about. Christine, to what degree is that collateral damage factored into this market and being priced in at the moment? Well, Danny, it's interesting because, you know, we're seeing money markets, of course, pricing massive Fed rate hikes this year. We're seeing it playing out in the bond market. Where we're not seeing it is in financial conditions. You mm. know, those are still quite accommodative at the moment. And this is probably our closest read on the real economy impact of all of this. You know, what we're seeing from the Fed, what we're seeing in the bond yield moves, and the fact that that is still actually lagging behind these uh, more real-time market indicators tells you that 
perhaps there is quite a delay for the consumer at the moment and potentially it could get much much worse mm. before it starts getting better because yeah I think you know the US CPI inflation will be very inf informative in telling us how much of this is really flowing through to the real economy at the moment and how much of it can actually still come through and so potentially we could be looking at perhaps a six month delay until we start really seeing that peak pain for consumers and that is potentially bad news again for the Fed which is again trying to I suppose now they're acknowledging that there is going to be a bit more of a bumpy landing rather than a soft uh, supportive landing for the economy. Yeah the, the financial conditions point I, I think is a really significant one because yes we have seen bonds sell off stocks sell off too. Sandra I, I wonder to what extent the Fed is the Fed put is gone in other words in order to really tighten these financial conditions as we look at market sell off. Yeah, well, the, the issue is that financial conditions need to tighten in order for the Fed to be effective. And, um, and actually, we believe that um, th this is definitely could, could not be the end of it yet, because what we're seeing at the same time is that um, if you look at a global index that we have created of uh, supply bottlenecks, uh, that is uh, going back up again after it was actually coming down uh, at the end of the pandemic. But um, given that China has uh, like increasingly larger parts of its of its mainland in in lockdown, uh, so what we're seeing now is that Chinese demand for oil is going down a bit, which is putting which is a relief on 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 the energy prices. But um, before we know it, uh, it will be the supply that will be um, mm. uh, affected again from China, and that will mean increasing bottlenecks yeah. and increasing uh, uh, price pressure also in the U.S. And that will mean that the Fed will have to uh, very aggressively be hiking in order to to get back to its uh, Fed funds targets. Uh, and we believe right. that will be uh, 50 basis points of, of hiking in May and in June before it can uh, move into a little bit calmer waters of 25 basis points uh, rate hikes. Christina, you know, what Sandra is describing here, it does feel like an environment where you'd see the curve flatten more, where it'd be the front end that is really reacting to all this. And we have seen this, but in recent sessions, it's been this this bear steepening. I mean, what do you make of that, that that's the trade that's being put on right now? Well, it's really interesting, Danny, because it tells you a lot about how the markets is trying to assess the Fed's impact on longer term growth and inflation. And perhaps it is an indication of how much faith they have or lack thereof in the Fed in really getting those prices down because it really has ramped up quite a bit. We're potentially looking at double digit inflation numbers in the U.S. later today. There's certainly some talk of that coming through. And so when you're in the situation where the Fed there is this perception that the Fed is quite behind a curve and that's why we've seen this ramp up in in hawkish talk that's also being reflected in the shape of the curve and in, in, in the bond market it, so it's going to be really interesting to see what those numbers tell us this afternoon and what would could be the ensuing response from the Fed between now and of course that very crucial May meeting right and whether the expectation is okay this is the peak of inflation this is as high as it's going to get Christine thanks as always that's Christine Aquino our markets editor and Sandra Flippin Chief Economist at ABN AMRO is going to stick around with us. Coming up, how has the soaring cost of living in the UK affected the labor market? We had those figures earlier. We're going to break down the numbers for you on UK unemployment next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Data out this morning showed that UK unemployment dropped back to its pre pandemic level at the start of 2022. But wages continue to fall behind the rate of inflation. Sandra Flippin, chief economist at ABN AMRO, is still with us. And Sandra, the numbers showing a 1.3% decline in wages if you take into, effect, into account inflation. I was talking with Chris Gray of Manpower Group earlier, who said just put simply corporations can't afford to pay their employees enough to keep up with inflation. Now I know you have a different view. What do you make of this gap in wages? Yeah well there, there are a lot of factors uh, causing uh, or basically causing the lack of wage growth uh, in, 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 in the UK but it's the same story in the Netherlands and in Germany. 
um, what we're seeing is that basically uh, corporates have a lot of are sitting on a lot of cash, uh, particularly those corporates that have not been uh, that hit from the pandemic because of course the pandemic uh, was a, a big blow to uh, corporations, but mainly corporations in the leisure industries. Uh, other corporations have actually um, pretty substantially seen seen an increase in in the cash that they're setting on. So I don't think that's that's the whole argument, but I do have to admit mm. there are two things that are uh, getting hard for, for corporates. One is that um, those that are hit by the pandemic, they are uh, suffering from, from still debt burdens, also sometimes uh, uh, tax uh, deferrals that, that still have to be paid back, and that could be a burden down the line. And of course, what's now coming into that as well is that particularly for energy incentive, intensive sectors, uh, the cost increase uh, from the energy price rises uh, is also squeezing them because they can't always pass this uh, price increase on to consumers. Well, it's not, of course, just the UK. This is a really a global story of the impact of energy on inflation. And certainly in Europe, that features really heavily. Uh, the latest CPI figures, the latest inflation readings, I mean, they just keep charting higher, Sandra. It doesn't really look like there is a peak in sight here. We have the ECB uh, meeting later this week. You have front end of European bonds uh, getting hammered. I mean, is are we pricing in really the right amount of aggressiveness that we will see from the ECB? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. I think that um, the markets are a bit overdoing it on the on, on the uh, rate high expectations that are being priced in. So currently uh, for this year, uh, uh, even there is about 50 basis points uh, priced in. We think that's uh, overdone. Um, and that is because we have a different expectations on growth and inflation going forward uh, this and next year. So um, uh, we do expect, of course, inflation is extremely high and it will stay elevated uh, for quite a while. Um, but this inflation is uh, also like com combined with what we just talked about, the, the wage growth uh, staying relatively modest. That means that uh, real wages uh, are going down. And those uh, downward real wages are going to affect consumer spending down the line. And this is going to lower growth. So there we basically have competing um, yeah, competing uh, variables. So one is the, the inflation going up, uh, uh, incentivizing the central bank uh, or necessitating it to, to, to do rate hikes. But at the same time, right. growth is being lowered. And this is the stagflation scenario that, that we're all talking about. Um, how, but, how real so is that? We, Sandra, if I can just jump in, how real is that scenario yeah. to you? How likely is it that we will face a stagflationary environment in Europe? Um, I think it's very likely. So uh, we're, we're, I think it's 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 really uh, already uh, in the signs. Um, and actually, uh, we also know that more is coming because uh, China's mainland is, uh, for a large part, going into lockdowns, and that is going to hit uh, labor supply and and output. And that basically will uh, increase the bottlenecks that were just going down at the end of the pandemic. It will go up again, and that will add to the inflationary pressure. And of mm. course, the worry of the ECB is that these supply side inflation dynamics will uh, at some point trickle down into the uh, uh, demand uh, or the broader set of inflation uh, basket. And that will be something that the ECB wants to prevent. And so we do think right. normalization is still the path that the ECB is on. But um, we think that at the once QE has ended, let's say in September, that the ECB will step in with a very mild uh, hiking cycle. So let's say 10 basis points at the end of the year and then maybe 10 more in March. But then the underlying uh, growth uh, reduction will basically uh, cause the ECB to, uh, to hold its, its okay. hiking cycle. Okay, Sandra, hold those thoughts. We're going to continue into the supply story, the de demand story more globally in a moment. Stick with us. That's Sandra yeah. Flippin. But first, let's turn to the picture in China, where the U.S. has told non-essential consular staff and their families to leave Shanghai, as the vast majority of the city remains under strict COVID restrictions. Residents are frustrated, and the world's second largest economy is under pressure. But China's strict COVID zero strategy remains paramount. Joining us now is Bloomberg's China economy editor, James Mager. Uh, James, so perhaps some restrictions seem to be easing, but at the moment, what's the impact on the ground?
you know, as you say, some of the people who have been locked down have been able to leave their houses now. They're able to walk around the community. Um, there aren't that many shops that are open. Up, you know, supermarkets and you know, restaurants, or at least, are still closed. So even the people that'd be able to go out can't go anywhere. But and so, you know, the impact on the domestic economy in Shanghai, but also broadly, is still continuing. You know, the port is still backed up. You're, I think you're still seeing, you know, problems with getting trucks, uh, you know, trucking goods across the city. And, and there are lots of factories also in Shanghai, which are also which are also closed. You know, the Tesla factory, for example, is closed. VW's factory is closed in the city. And so, you know, the, the impact on the domestic economy, on domestic production, on domestic uh, retail sales is obviously going to be huge. Yeah, and then you add into that the effect that this will have on on global supply chains. This is already affecting Chinese demand for overseas goods. You know, it's making it harder for people to land goods like copper in the Chinese ports. Uh, LNG demand is going down from China. And then obviously, if this flows through, if this you know these lockdown continues, or you see other lockdowns in other places, and it flows through, and makes shipments of Chinese exports slower. It's going to affect um, you know the price of goods in markets in the U.S. and Europe. So you know the, the lockdown in Shanghai looks like it. You know the government is kind of saying now they're indicating maybe in another couple of weeks where you know they'll get this under control, but the cases are still very high. So you're still going to see this lockdown in Shanghai continue for quite a while. There are other places in China, uh, in China that are also seeing cases, and they could go into lockdown or have some restrictions as well. So it's a very fluid situation. But the effects on the domestic economy, but also the global economy, are. Are, are quite large. All right, James, thank you very much. That's Bloomberg's China Economy Editor, James Mager. And still with us is Sandra Flippin, Chief Economist at ABN AMRO. So, Sandra, you were talking earlier how this is feeding to this view that we're not yet at normalization in this economy, considering lockdowns in China. Is there a link that you're looking for when it comes to the port congestions, to the factory closures that will add to this? Or is there scarring already done at this point? Uh, yes. Um, well, actually, the, 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 the figures that, that James is showing are very, very interesting. Um, I think that uh, we're already... So, so what we're now seeing in, in China is basically already feeding through the uh, global su uh, supply bottleneck indicator. So we've constructed our own indicator uh, consisting of uh, 9 to 12 uh, different indices. Uh, uh, indicating global supply disruptions. And there we already see that things are um, getting worse again. Uh, so, so that is this. And actually, so there is one interesting element here is because James said that uh, LNG demand is, uh, is being reduced because people have to stay at home. That is a kind of window of opportunity for, um, for Europe because uh, Europe is basically, uh, at this point in time, very, very eager to get all the yeah. LNG uh, that is out there in the market to fill its uh, reserves in order to right. um, survive an, an, an oil and gas uh, embargo uh, uh, from, Russia, from Russia. So I think right. this is a, an interesting situation. And also the other side effect uh, um, is that basically okay. uh, the situation in China lowers the demand for, uh, for oil at the moment, which is also causing a slightly uh, lowered oil price which is helpful in the whole inflation dynamics, but it's just a short-term relief. All right, Sandra, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks so much for joining us today. That's Sandra Flippin, Chief Economist at ABN AMRO. Now, coming up, Austria's chancellor says he's pessimistic over peace prospects. That's after a meeting with President Putin in Moscow. We're going to have more on that story next. This is Bloomberg. Let's get the latest on the war in Ukraine. And Austrian Chancellor Karl Nehammer has become the first EU leader to visit Vladimir Putin in Moscow since the start of the war. Following talks, Nehammer didn't offer a positive view on the Kremlin's position. I have no optimistic impression that I can bring you from this conversation with President Putin. The offensive is obviously being massively prepared, but therefore also the clear commitment that a stable access of the International Red Cross is needed. Let's get more from Bloomberg's Aggie Cantrell. So, Aggie, not a positive outcome or at least an optimistic one, but what had the Austrian leader hoped he would gain out of this meeting? So the Austrian leader was specifically saying uh, in that briefing that he gave to the press afterwards that 
while he, he was not optimistic at the result of the meeting, that he thought that personal, in-person, pri uh, private discussions were still a key format and an important format for the negotiations ongoing. So that, and while this was not EU mandated, this visit to to, to Russia, he had managed to get the uh, to consult with President Zelensky of Ukraine and also with other EU leaders before he went to Moscow. And he was looking at securing humanitarian corridors and pressing, uh, pressur pressuring the Russians into allowing for uh, these humanitarian corridors to be established safely, especially in the Donbass region, where we have heard in recent days that there has uh, been a regrouping and resupplying of Russian forces around that region. And there is a clear concern of the possibility of greater civilian casualties in that area. All right, Aggie, thank you very much. That's Bloomberg's Aggie Cantrell giving us the latest update uh, of the Austrian uh, uh, president there going to Russia. Now, coming up, APV, APB Invest CIO Thanos Papasavos on the Fed and Russian sanctions. We're going to have that conversation next. This is Bloomberg. It's U.S. Inflation Day. Stocks and bonds sell off with the 10-year Treasury yield at the highest since 2018. Shanghai in crisis. The U.S. pulls out non-essential consulate staff amid widespread COVID lockdowns. Plus, pessimistic about peace. The Austrian chancellor warns of a spiral of violence in Ukraine's east after meeting Vladimir Putin in Moscow. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London, standing in for Francine Lacroix. First, let's get your check in markets. And after Monday's ugliness, the ugliness continues on Tuesday. Anticipation of 8.4% on CPI. There's an ECB meeting. There's a sale, a bond sale coming from Amazon. There's Treasury auctions. All of that resulting in a selling of bonds across this global market. Your 10-year yields up by four basis points, 2.82%. German bonds those yields highest since 2015. UK 10-year yields up five basis points. I should say the front end of the curve there in gilts also at a decade high. Meanwhile, equities continue to sell off. European stocks down nearly 1%. Now, looking into the individual regions, some of the ones underperforming, the DAX down 1.5%. Get, we'll get to those movers in just a moment. The Cacaron also undoing yesterday's gains over the optimism of Macron in the lead. The global bond market story, ECB normalization, that takes taking center stage. UK outperforming with oil up 2% this morning. Now, here's what I was talking about with the DAX. We have this unknown seller of both Deutsche Bank and Commerce Bank stock, about the equivalent of $2 billion, 1.5 for Deutsche Bank, 0.5 for Commerce Bank. Again, we don't know who it is, but at least when it comes to Deutsche Bank, the two biggest holders there who have enough size to have this move, um, one of them being BlackRock, but of course, they are a passive investor. The other one uh, is Capital Group that has a large enough stake. All right, so that's the look on markets. Now, let's return to the global economy. Let's reset and the risk of recession on the back of elevated inflation. We're joined now by Thanos Papasava, CIO and founder of APB Invest, along with Bloomberg market editor Christine Aquino. So I think kind of to set the scene here, Christine, I'd like to bring you in and just sort of give us the latest on the speed and move of this bond market sell-off. Look, Danny, this is unprecedented in a lot of ways. You know, we're just coming off the back of a record loss for Treasuries. It's the biggest ever that we've seen, at least in data going back to the mid-1970s. Certainly not something that your modern-day bond trader has really seen. And it's really continuing apace. And, you know, I was just looking at the year-end forecast, for instance, for the U.S. 10-year yield. I think they're standing at 2.8% at the moment. So we are there. It didn't take long for we're four months into 2022, and we're there for the year-end forecast. People are starting to talk about that 3% and north of 3% level for 10-year treasuries, which again has been highlighted as a particularly painful point for a lot of these risky assets that have been benefiting from lower yields up until now. Well, Thanos, you know, amid all of this, one of the things that's been really interesting in the moves is that we're seeing bear steepening in the curve. It had been flattening, but that's changed. I know that this is a position that you've had on as well, and it's clear other folks do. So walk me through your thinking there. Yeah. Well, in fact, we, we were in favor of a steepening, and we closed our position last okay. March in 2021. And we stayed 
out of the market until we saw it really collapse down to the 20 basis points. Mm. And, and here, the reason why we once again moved in favor of a steepener is looking through the very high probability of an inversion in the near term. Because medium term and long term, these are very good, attractive risk return characteristics for the yield curve to re-steepen. Mm. So it's not a call on the near term. We're very much sort of of a view that the curve will invert temporarily alongside the euro dollar curve. But more medium term, it's, it's, it's a good risk return uh, position to have. But, but I do have to wonder, when you look at this huge deal that Amazon is doing, the seven-part bond auction, when you look at the Treasury uh, selling 20s, 30s, when you look at the mortgage market, those extremely high and the lack of refinancing, I mean, how much on the long end is sort of more of a technical factor and we'll have a resumption of the flattening if it is again those sorts of things that are causing this move I think it's partly that I think it's also partly the realization of markets that they've been totally totally whipsawed over the last year being very complacent in terms of inflation trusting the Fed when the Fed got it wrong last year mm. and and I believe there's a change in the underlying mindset and awareness however my my issues we've been very hawkish on on interest rates and we've been negative on inflation but my issue is that although the markets have shifted their view for inflation in the near term they still don't see inflation in the more medium to longer mm -hmm. term and i believe there's still a disconnect between the sort of five year five year forwards uh, where we expect that inflation to be and where the markets are so although the markets are hawkish now on inflation they're still relatively dovish to where I think they should be five years out. Now that's, that's really interesting because, Christine, I was looking through the Bloomberg economics forecast as well, and they see inflation coming down pretty dramatically after the CPI reading. I mean, is that fair what Thanos is talking about, this idea that, okay, near-term inflation high, but the market does perhaps is overdoing it? in the medium longer term for how much it comes down. Well, I think I agree with Athanas's point that perhaps markets haven't come around to the idea that inflation could be elevated for a prolonged period of time. I mean, we have seen an era of below target inflation. This is what we've gotten used to over the past decade. And there's really no reason to think that it couldn't go the other way around where it just stays elevated above those various central bank targets, targets for a long period of time, especially now that we're in a situation where central banks are increasingly coming to the realization that they really just have been simply behind a curve in terms of tackling this and thus we're seeing a lot of rhetoric for uh, fast action and immediate action from the Fed and various other central banks. Would you look at that agreement yeah. perhaps? But, I don't know are you about to disagree Thanos break not, the peace on surveillance. No, 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 <laughs> not at all. I, I just think that it's important just to uh, identify what those sort of levels are. In other yeah. words I do expect inflation to remain um, sticky and elevated, but not at sort of six or eight percent levels. Right, okay. I think it'll stabilize around the sort of the three and a half percent level, which is s similar to, I think, what you're saying, just above that sort of two percent target, but not levels where we are now. So stabilize around the sort of three, three and a half percent level. Yeah, and again, I think the Bloomberg economics, it is about 4% they see, so not too dissimilar, but I guess it is this idea that, you know, 2%, we're not, we're not quite there. Um, uh, Christine, just want to change asset classes here for one moment. Uh, Marco Kalanovich saying that it's time to take some profit for stocks, which even though he's bullish on stocks feels significant because this is a guy who is an uber bull. Um, is the sentiment starting to change, even among those who are very bullish on this equity market now? It certainly seems that way, Danny. I mean, like you said, an Uber bull who is suddenly saying that it's time to take profit on stocks, probably about as good a signal as you can get in terms of the equity market at the moment. And, you know, it's funny because last week we were kind of discussing this idea that equity markets, given their resilience despite the bond sell-off, seemed like they weren't really willing to believe that the Fed is about to really go on this massive type cycle until they finally see it but looks like this week the narrative has shifted quite a bit I think that those levels that we cross on 10-year Treasury yields really driving home the point the point that there is this massive quantitative tightening cycle that's about to come and it's really not just on the rate hike side of the equation the Fed reminding us last week as well that they have this other lever which is the balance sheet runoff which a combination of both of those would be potentially powerful. Okay, we're going to have to leave the conversation there for now. Thanos, I know you want to comment on equities too. I'm sure I can feel it. We'll get to that in just a moment. Thanks so much to Bloomberg's Christine Aquino. Thanos Papasavas, CIO and founder of APB Invest, is going to stick around with us. Now, White House economic advisor Brian Deese says the Biden administration expects an elevated consumer price index when numbers are released this afternoon. Deese spoke to David Weston on Balance of Power.
Certainly we are expecting an elevated CPI print uh, tomorrow and uh, that will reflect the month of March and the month of March is where we really have will see and have seen the impact of President Putin's invasion of Ukraine uh, on energy prices and other other commodities. Uh, we know that because we've already seen what's happened uh, to uh, gas prices in the United States and that will be reflected in what will likely be a, a big divergence between the headline uh, and core. Uh, the Real focus now here uh, in terms of looking forward is what we can do to try to mitigate the, uh, that run up in prices. You've seen the president take some significant actions like the historic release of oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and how we can provide some relief to consumers who are feeling uh, the brunt uh, of those increases. Our, our hope is that if we can move forward on those efforts, we can stay focused on the task at hand that we will uh, see Inflationary pressures moderate, will be lower at the end of this year than we are today and lower uh, still in the coming year. Uh, that's our focus and that's our hope. White House economic advisor there, Brian Deese. Now let's get to the first word news. With that is Leanne Garens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Danny, and thank you. The U.S. has told non-essential consular staff to leave Shanghai, with the vast majority of the city's residents still under strict COVID lockdown. On Monday, Shanghai said it was easing restrictions in compounds which had no infections in the past two weeks. However, details published overnight suggest the number of people released is smaller than actually suggested. More than 23,000 COVID cases were reported on Monday, a reduction from Sunday's record total. Now, Sri Lanka has suspended payments on some foreign debt as it faces dwindling reserves of foreign currency. The finance ministry says all outstanding payments to bondholders, bilateral creditors and institutional lenders will be suspended. The government wants to expedite talks with the IMF and says it's aiming to avoid a hard default in the country. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg. Danny. Leanne, thanks so much. Coming up, we're going to break down how the soaring cost of living in the UK is affecting the labor market and continue the market's conversation next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Now, as yields have moved higher, stocks, too, have moved lower. You're looking at a year, real yield that has climbed closer to being positive. And amid all that, that's the earnings picture we're just looking at. Here is your relation between the 10-year yield and NASDAQ 100 stocks. That index has erased more than $1 trillion over the past five trading sessions. Still with us is Thanos Papasava, CIO and founder of ABP Invest. Um, Thanos, so you turned more negative on S&P 500 in February. You're hanging on to that. Walk me through your call. Yeah, we, we turned negative on the S&P partly because of our view that the Fed was behind the curve. They have to overcompensate. The risk of them making a mistake and sort of tilting the economy over to a recession is higher. We, we don't believe that the Fed will be able to deliver all the rate hikes that it's pricing in. Um, and we also talked about earlier about the inversion of the euro dollar curve, right. the US to stands. So we turned negative the S&P in, um, in February. We also more recently turned negative the US high yield market. Mm. Um, we had been neutral. We had turned negative the investment investment grade last summer, but we didn't turn in high yield, we didn't see the risk of recession. But now, with the risk of recession slightly more elevated and, and, and spreads from a valuation point of view slightly tighter, we also turn negative. So negative U.S. high yield, which also correlates to negative European high yield. So, I mean, this is a very risk negative view. Like a lot of these risk yes. assets um, that perhaps would have given you that juice, that return in your portfolio. What does that mean if you can't rely on those right now? No, I think I think that's a very fair point. And this is the discussion that we're sort of having broader in, within the asset allocation. Where do you readjust? So within the within the S&P, our preference would be for value versus mm. growth. So there's a preference there. 
However, there are some areas, such as, for example, some of the emerging markets, which tend to be further away from the epicenter of the Russian-Ukrainian war, such as Latin America, which have done well, very much underpriced by the markets and super well-delivered in terms mm. of the central bank policy. So there are pockets of, of opportunities, but it's more of a tactical rather than a strategic asset allocation view. And also alternatives and commodities, which are likely to benefit within the space of, of higher inflation. So, so it's enough that we have that threat of recession to turn us sour on stocks, on high yields. We don't actually need to see a recession, is that correct? Or is this a call that it's going to be recession in 2023? It is, it is, it is, it, it, it is difficult to be f fully confident of that yeah. because our own quantitative models and the broader recessionary models don't have a high probability of a recession because we're looking at the labor markets which are super tight financial conditions indices have not tightened yet so if you like it's a qualitative view that the probability of recession is increasing mm. triggering us to make those shifts but it's not we don't have the confirmation yet it's a preliminary preemptive call of a recession right and, and we could be wrong yeah and it, but but you're not alone yeah. right certainly more of that sort of yeah. we could see an elevated risk of recession that certainly has been filtering through thanos thanks so much for joining us this morning really appreciate it fascinating conversation thanos papasava cio and founder of abp invest now let's get to your bloomberg business flash with that is leanne garens good morning leanne danny good morning and thank you chinese premier Li ke chung has issued a third warning about economic risks in less than a week suggesting heightened concerns about the outlook as COVID lockdowns disrupt production and spending. Lee told local authorities that they should add a sense of urgency when implementing policies. Now, the billionaire Benetton family and Blackstone are said to be nearing a takeover offer for Italian infrastructure giant Atlantia. Bloomberg understands a plan to buy out and take the company private, which could become 2022's biggest deal, could come as early as tomorrow. And that's your Bloomberg. Bloomberg Business Flash. Danny. Leanne, thanks so much. Now to the UK where Boris Johnson has approved an inquiry into Chancellor Rishi Sunak's financial affairs. Sunak asked the Prime Minister for a review in an attempt to draw a line under growing questions about his financial arrangements after details of his wife's tax status and his US green card emerged. A government spokeswoman said the Prime Minister has offered his full support to Sunak. We spoke to the UK's economic secretary to the Treasury. I recognise these are challenging times for him uh, and his family, but he will come through them. But his focus is on doing what it takes to get the British economy into the right place through these very, very difficult times. And he's made a number of interventions dealing with the thresholds of when you start to pay national insurance and tax, support for the least well-off in society. Of course, there will be many who will say there's more to be done, and he will look to, to the future uh, fiscal events to address some of those concerns. How do you feel when, as a member of, you know, Conservative Party, looking mm. at really what ethically it's being judged at mm. by at the moment, when we think of the, the, the party gate that the leader of your mm. party went, underwent, when we look at the Chancellor of Exchequer, who seemingly just doesn't seem to be in touch with reality, many people feel that, mm. and his holding a green card at the same time as being Chancellor of the Exchequer, what sort of really tethering he has in the longer term to the country. And then you, of course, I mean, nothing to do with you, I realise, but certain, you know, today, just the unseating of, of an MP and, and a crisis election because of, you know, previous misdemeanours when it comes to sexual abuse. I mean, mm. how does it make you feel when you're trying to stand up here in the US and defend your Conservative Party? Well, I've been in this post for nearly four and a half years. I'm the longest serving economic secretary we've had in the UK. It's a great privilege to do this job and I, like the Chancellor, focus on the task in hand. I've done that through three chancellors and uh, I, I've always been impressed by the professionalism of the people I've worked under and there's no difference with Rishi Sunak, who's a first-rate boss, a first-rate Chancellor. And I have absolute confidence in that he will come through these difficult moments and we will uh, you know, see what can be done in terms of future fiscal events of the budget. UK Economic Secretary to the Treasury John Glenn there speaking to Caroline Hyde about Chancellor Rishi Sunak's tax row. Coming up, waiting for Elon Musk's next Twitter move. The Tesla chief may raise his stake in the social media company after declining to join the board. More on that story next. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Speculation is mounting over Elon Musk's intentions for Twitter. The Tesla CEO had declined a board seat, raising the prospect of the potential acquisition of more shares in the social media company. Last week, Musk disclosed that he had a stake of just over 9%, becoming Twitter's largest individual shareholder. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg Quick Takes Alex Webb. And of course, the idea of him buying more shares is this idea that he would have been capped if he had joined the board. But during the break, we were just discussing this idea of what it would mean for him in terms of fiduciary responsibility should he join the board. Walk us through that as to why that might not have been attractive for Elon Musk. I mean, essentially, he would have had guardrails imposed on him, like perhaps limiting some of the things he could tweet, but also like making him commit to acting in the interests of all shareholders, not just himself. And if we look at the, the things that he's doing at Twitter, if we look at the size of his stake, it doesn't really look as though this is a financial play. He doesn't need the money. Right. He's worth $270 plus billion. This stake is... He probably acquired it for about two and a half billion dollars. It's less than one percent of his net worth. So if it's not really a financial motivation, it's about influence. And if it's about influence, then maybe it's not going to be the interest of all shareholders, whatever he has in mind. And so perhaps it means he doesn't have that legal obligation anymore. He can remain outside the tent throwing things into it. But how does that work in terms of what he can actually get done? Because if I just apply perhaps some like very circular thinking here, but if Elon Musk is pressuring Parag Agarwal to do something, but that's only in the interest of Elon Musk, it doesn't serve all shareholders. I mean, is that, are these things that Twitter can actually implement? Well, the thing is, he does have the ability to clearly build a bigger stake, and that is a sort of Damoclean sword yeah. hanging above Twitter <laughs> now. It is something that if he does so, he can then think about agitating for more board members who would perhaps be beholden to him to a greater extent, but he is now still able to corral his however many tens of millions of Twitter followers that he has, and not just be on the inside as perhaps a solitary board member talking to the other 11 members. I mean, there's also been some weirdness in terms of SEC perhaps enforcement or some confusion around when he filed and what forms he used to file. Does the fact he's not on the board make things simpler? Would it have been more complicated if he had joined the board? How does that factor in? I mean, it certainly limits some of the punishments because it, they couldn't say, well... He, ha he can't be a member of the board. If he's, you know, there is some, that would have been an obvious thing that if he had broken some rules and they say, well, you can't be a board member right. for a number of years. But now that isn't a punishment. It, look, there are circles within circles here. It's vastly complex. I think the key thing is, like, I'm not sure that even Elon knows exactly what he's doing. Right. You know, he's throwing a lot of chips up in the air, seeing where they land. Uh, and for him, you know... Don't forget, Twitter's not a big company. Twitter's a sort yeah. of $37 billion market cap company. Twitter's revenue is the same amount as BT's profit. It, it's 5% the size of Facebook by market cap. His ability then to just nudge things around is a lot greater than it would be if he had, say, gone into Meta, for instance. Right. What I'm gathering from all of this is just to be prepared for more wacky Twitter polls from Elon Musk. Exactly. And don't <laughs> turn on your notifications for him tweeting. Yes, exactly. Alex, thanks so much. As always, that's Bloomberg's Alex Webb, who's been keeping us on top of the Twitter story uh, throughout the week. Now, let's get to your market check. We're looking at S&P 500 futures just barely turning positive, or maybe they're a little bit negative now. A lot of back and forth, but NASDAQ futures, those have turned positive, up one-tenth of one percent. Some of the losses in treasuries easing a little bit. That's perhaps allowing the outperformance of NASDAQ, but still awaiting CPI that could certainly impact what futures, uh, the stocks, and of course bonds do if that sell-off continues. Well, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues the next hour. Matt Miller and Kaylee Lyons in New York, and Anna Edwards out of London. This is Bloomberg. The recession chatter is ubiquitous. I mean, it's everywhere. We are facing a lot of uncertainty. We're facing uh, rocky waters right now. What we're really seeing now is an increase in volatility, uh, the market really is positioning itself for the Fed to be more aggressive. Looks like a Fed that has to fight the world um, from the top side. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Tuesday, April 12th. Our top stories today.
European stocks are falling again while U.S. futures fluctuate and the Treasury 10-year yield exceeds 2.8%. Data coming out today may show that March was the high water point for inflation in the United States. Catastrophe in Ukraine. The mayor of the city of Mariupol says that six weeks of fighting left more than 10,000 civilians dead. And in China, a sign that COVID lockdowns are taking their toll on production and spending. Premier Li Keqiang issues a third warning about economic growth risks in less than a week. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. And Kaylee, it seems to be expectation of a high level of inflation in the United States, kind of taking the wind out of risk assets globally. Yeah, we could be looking at an eight handle on the CPI figures later on this morning. So that is definitely something that U.S. investors have to consider. For Asian investors, though, of course, that session took place before the data comes out. And it really was mixed. You had the uh, MSCI Asia Pacific Index lower by a few tenths of 1%, but Hong Kong and China actually outperformed. China, of course, still dealing with the lockdown in Shanghai. That has led the U.S. to say not non-essential government personnel should pull out of the city. And yet Chinese stocks actually rose about 2%. There is a lot of speculation that officials are going to step in to shore up growth in the economy in the face of that COVID zero policy. And of course, outside of the equity market, we continue to see the global bond sell off rippling across the world. True to in Australia, where the 10 year yield was up seven basis points at 3.08%. That is the highest going Going back to 2015. Meanwhile, the Japanese yen weaker once again against the dollar as the dollar strengthens with higher treasury yields. Right now sitting at 125.64. That is the weakest yen going back two decades all the way to July of 2002. And finally, also, Matt, we have to make note of Sri Lanka today. The company warned uh, the country warning of a potential default halting payments to some foreign creditors, really trying to preserve its dollar stockpile for things like fuel and food as it's facing a uh, protest around inflation in the country. So that took Sri Lankan debt uh, maturing in July of this year down to 46 cents on the dollar. That is a record low, Matt. Yeah, uh, a default there, maybe a warning sign for the world, right? Because as prices for few food and fuel rise that are priced in dollars, a lot of countries don't have enough dollar reserves on hand. So this is a real concern. Take a look at what's going on in the U.S. Not a lot of movement in S&P futures, but we were down in the cash trade 1.7% yesterday. And you can see the U.S. 10-year yield also continues to rise 2 spot 8167%. So more than 2 per 0.8%. That's the highest level since 2018 now. Um, NYMEX crude right now is up about 3.6%. It was down 4% yesterday, so it's kind of bouncing back from yesterday's losses at 97.67. Brent, by the way, at one point this morning was below $100. The global benchmark It's back up over that price now, though. And Bitcoin rising 8 tenths of percent, so maybe a risk on uh, a sign for later on today in trading 40,162. So still a relatively low level compared to where we've seen it over the past few sessions. Anna? Uh, we've got a pretty bleak picture here for European stocks right now. I can tell you we're off lows, but the German market down by 1.1%. The French market down by nine tenths of a percent. Some of the data continues to look gloomy out of uh, Europe's largest economy, and that is the uh, German ZEW investor expectations. So a survey of financial service professionals, just how, just what do they expect from the year ahead? That reading has come in at 41, minus 41, sorry. The estimate uh, was for a drop of minus 48. So maybe not quite as negative as had been anticipated, but we'd already seen the biggest drop in this particular survey data since the early 1990s in last month's survey, of course, reflecting war on the Ukraine, which would have surprised many finance professionals as much as everybody else. Uh, let me take you through what we're seeing on uh, certain uh, German banking assets. So sticking with the German theme, we've got Commerce Bank and Deutsche Bank moving lower this morning, quite substantially so in the case of Commerce Bank, but really off earlier losses. We've seen some of these stocks down by more than 8 9% in the early part of the trading day. A big holder of these companies selling these stocks today, trying to raise around $2 billion US dollars in the process, the holder, uh, the holder's identity currently unidentified. Uh, the Brent crude price up by 3.6%. So things have been looking a little bit more normal as we come back down from those $120 a barrel levels that we've seen recently uh, in recent weeks. But still, we are seeing quite a lot of volatility with quite a sizable move this morning in Brent crude. And I put in the UK 10-year yield just to highlight the global trend, of course, is still a big focus on higher yields. That's true in the US, as we were hearing, but also here in Europe with German and UK assets, but also to highlight the tightness of the UK labour market 
market. We had jobs data out today. The tightest labour market, we understand from Bloomberg News colleagues, in living memory. On Russian assets, then, the global theme still applies. Uh, we are seeing a pullback from global equities, concerns around the pace of the, uh, of the rise that we're seeing in yields globally, and in particular in the US, weighing on, on Russia as in elsewhere. And we're seeing the, uh, the index there down by 2.5%. The Russian ruble in focus. We had these interesting comments earlier from President Putin, Kayleigh, uh, talking to IFX uh, news agency, saying that he has no intention of cutting Russia off from the world. But there we are, Russian uh, ruble 83 at the, at this point of the uh, trading day. Kayleigh. Yeah, and I guess the question is how much that choice is Russia's and how much that choice is the rest of the world's. Now a look at what is ahead today. We will be getting more Fed speak, but Governor Lael Brainerd and Richmond Fed President Tom Birkin uh, will be speaking to these markets. President Biden also will be traveling to Iowa for the first time since the 2020 election. And of course, the big event of the day, inflation data in America. We'll get U.S. CPI at 8.30 a.m. New York time. For more on that, Mike McKee, Bloomberg International National economics and policy correspondent joins us now for more of what to expect. So, Mike, an eight handle we're potentially looking at here. Yeah, you know those horror movies that they just do sequel after sequel after sequel and finally they run out of gas? We're hoping that this is the horror movie that's going to run out of gas in terms of inflation because you look at the numbers, as Kaylee said, the year over year number is expected to come in, according to the Bloomberg survey, at 8.4 percent. It was this January of 1982 when we had a giant cold snap, by the way, nine degrees below zero in the Cincinnati Bengals playoff game. The last time we saw a number like that, 19, a little bit later in 1982, 6.6%. .6%. So this is really going to get the attention of people in the markets. But since I've been giving you the bad news, let me give you the good news. This could be the peak of inflation for a number of different reasons. First of all, this is the monthly inflation change. And as you can see, in March, April, May, June of last year, inflation came in very, very high. That's what's called the base effect. So now whatever we add to that isn't going to be as much. And so starting with this month's numbers coming out next month, we will see lower inflation on a month over month basis. And then here's the good news. Gasoline prices have finally started to roll over. And that will mean less of a contribution from energy to the overall inflation rate. And that should be some good news. The bad news there, of course, is is still going to be very high for quite some time. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't come back down after it goes up, uh, or at least not very quickly. Michael McKee, with a look at inflation, will be paying very close attention later on to the CPI release just about three and a half hours uh, from now. The relentless sell-off in Treasuries continues. That's something you can't not pay attention to, threatening to mark a resolute end to the four-decade bull run in bonds. Let's get more with Bloomberg's Danny Berger. Danny? I'll continue the Mike analogy and say this is the horror movie that we can't turn away from. And it is a global sell-off in bonds. So it's the CPI figures. It's also an ECB meeting later where they're expected to head towards normalization. It's this monster bond sale from Amazon, seven-part offering, and high mortgages that has dealers ditching treasuries. So what does that mean? It means that this 40-year bull market we're seeing in treasuries, if you were to map out the trend line on that mm -hmm. on a log scale for a radio listening audience, Audience, we have just barely pushed above this. It's not just treasuries. It's also the German bond market. Ten-year yields, those are at their highest since 2015. Front end of the gilt curve, it's highest in over a decade. It is angst rippling through the entirety of the bond market, and that's having a ripple effect on the stock market. And it's really those sort of longer duration equities, specifically tech. The Nasdaq 100 has sold off in the past five sessions, wiping out $1 trillion in market value. The central Sentiment is certainly changing here. The latest Bank of America survey has record gloom about this economy, highest assumptions of stagflation since 2008, and in a sign that sentiment is also starting to change. Uber bull Marco Kalanovic over at JP Morgan says it's time to start taking profit on U.S. stocks. Anna, this is someone who time after time he says safe to be in U.S. stocks. So he's talking more from a valuation standpoint, but still significant. We're starting to hear a change in tune from bulls. Danny, thanks very much. Danny Berger with what the rise in yields is doing to stock markets. Now, let's get back to the geopolitics. Ukraine expects Russia to widen its offensive in the east of the country this week. Troops are likely to try and take the port city of Mariupol, where 10,000 civilians have died since the invasion, according to the mayor of that city. The Austrian chancellor met with Russian leader Vladimir Putin yesterday, but didn't offer a positive view of Moscow's position.
I have no optimistic impression that I can bring you from this conversation with President Putin. The offensive is obviously being massively prepared, but therefore also the clear commitment that a stable access of the International Red Cross is needed. For more on the war in Ukraine, let's get to our reporters in Berlin and in Washington. We'll begin with Aggie Cantrell in Berlin. Aggie, uh, the Austrian Chancellor repeated warnings we've heard in recent days about the preparation for a massive Russian offensive in the east. What can you tell us about that? Yes, so there's a real concern uh, on the part of NATO allies and Ukraine itself that essentially Russia is uh, reinforcing and resupplying their troops in the Donbass region. This region, which has been disputed for a long period of time um, since 2014 um, and uh, is going to be what Russia is looking at in terms of territorial concessions from Ukraine in order to eke something out from this conflict that's now going into its second month soon. And so what we're seeing is that Russia is repurposing all of those troops that had been withdrawing from places like the capital Kyiv and they're looking at re uh, redirecting them to this region in the Donbass in order to pressure Ukraine uh, to, uh, to help Russia get a strategic corridor from Crimea to Russia, essentially bordering the country. And so that's what they're focusing on. And so the words of the Austrian Chancellor yesterday and from other leaders, they're very concerned about civilian casualties mounting in this region, especially mm. in cities like Mariupol that have been under siege since March 2nd. Yeah, and we understand there's already been thousands of civilian casualties already. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Aggie Cantrell. Now, President Biden struck a more upbeat tone in a virtual meeting with Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi yesterday. He said the two nations will keep working together to counter the fallout. The United States and India are going to continue our close consultation on how to manage the destabilizing effects of this Russian war. And I'm looking forward to our discussions today, Mr. Prime Minister. Our continued consultation and dialogue are key to ensuring the U.S.-Indian relationship continues to grow deeper and stronger. Emily Wilkins, Bloomberg government reporter, joins us now from Washington. So, Emily, more cooperation, but were there real tangible outcomes from this meeting? I mean, at this point, that does remain to be seen, Kaylee. We know that President Biden told Prime Minister Modi that the U.S. wants to help India diversify its oil and its natural resources. And we also know that White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said that Biden did warn Modi to not increase or accelerate his purchase of Russian oil and gas. Now, that doesn't mean, of course, that the U.S. is looking for India to no longer purchase any Russian oil. Uh, Biden really didn't give a commentary on that particular piece of it. Uh, you know, usually with India, they tend to remain a little bit neutral between some of these larger world powers. But we are seeing a headline cross the terminal this morning saying that India is going to boost shipments to Russia by $2 billion. And of course, this isn't oil and gas, but these are some items that are impacted by sanctions, things like pharmaceuticals, textiles, machinery. And so it'll definitely be interesting to watch this relationship between U.S. and India and India and Russia and kind of what dynamics are at play here. Certainly, India has a stake with both nations in terms of future shipments, future assistance uh, with defense weaponry, uh, and is certainly, at this point, seems to be trying to find that neutral space in between the two of them. All right, Emily, thanks very much. Emily Wilkins there from Bloomberg Government in Washington, D.C. Over in China, the Premier Li Keqiang is um, issuing his third warning in less than a week about risks to economic growth. This suggests more concern about the outlook as widespread COVID lockdowns disrupt production and spending. Let's get more with Enda Kern, our chief Asia economics correspondent in Hong Kong. So Enda, it looks like um, we're getting, you know, real profit warnings for the country. Yeah, exactly, Matt. It's a third warning, pretty unusual. And he's now speaking of the need for urgency in tackling what's going on with the economy. We know, of course, that the uh, aggressive controls on COVID is at the heart of all of this. We're seeing declines in house sales, declines in car sales. And now, of course, uh, our colleagues are reporting that excavator sales are coming off as well, one of the leading indicators for China, China's construction sector. Nomura are out today saying that there could even be a contraction of growth in the second quarter. And indeed, they made the point that the rest of the world isn't keeping a close enough eye on what's happening with China's economy because of what's going on with uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and, of course, the Fed interest rate, interest rate hikes coming up as well.
So by all accounts, it does show that the officials are getting worried about where China's economy is headed. They're talking about tax cuts and more borrowing and spending, but they're not talking about a major pivot away from the uh, dynamic zero or the aggressive control of COVID in China just yet. That's because of a big political meeting at the end of the year, and it's all important that they keep the disease under control before then. How much success, though, will they have in doing so? Thank you so much to Enda Curran, our chief Asia economics correspondent in Hong Kong. Now let's get back to the equity markets and take a look at some stocks moving in free market trading here in the U.S., all on the back of analyst action. First, you have an upgrade for CrowdStrike, the cyber company. It was raised at Goldman Sachs to a buy $285 price target, which would be about 32% upside from yesterday's close. It's up about 3% in early hours this morning, trading just shy of 223. It's a downgrade, though, for Cisco Systems. It was cut uh, over at City to a sell. That stock already down 17% year to date. It's off another 2% or so this morning. And you also had a downgrade from Morgan Stanley uh, coming for HP. $15 price target put on that stock this morning. It's trading right around that $15 level, down about 2.5% before the bell, Anna. Coming up on the program, Kaylee Priya Misra joins us, global head of rate strategy at TD Securities. We'll talk about the higher rates environment. And SPAC trades may have made up to 888% in profit. Now, some are drawing SEC scrutiny. You can read more about that in today's Big Take story by typing NI Big Take into your Bloomberg terminal. Plus, don't miss Bloomberg Crypto today at 1 p.m. New York time, 6 p.m. in London. Matt and Kaylee will be speaking to billionaire Sam Bankman Fried, CEO of FTX, a Cryptocurrency exchange. We know Matt is excited about that one. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. We are simulcast on radio and television. I'm Matt Miller here in New York with Kaylee Lyons and Edwards with us out of London. Now, I'm looking at a chart that if you're listening on radio, um, you can probably visualize this because it's a chart we've been showing quite often, not just in the last few days and weeks, but in the last few years. The question is, uh, this chart, I guess, um, um, asks, are we at the end of the bull market and treasuries? And so many points along this chart, we've had head fakes where people have said, you know what, this is it. And maybe, you know, once bitten, twice shy, the market's not going to believe it if it really happens this time. Tatiana Derry of uh, Markets Live, the Markets Live blog from Bloomberg, joins us now to talk about this. And Tatiana, the difference now, I would say, is that it's also the steepest inflation that we've had in 40 years. So maybe this really is the end. What do you think? Exactly, Matt. And the difference now is that the Fed is really determined to tighten. So if they were to deliver on these very hawkish expectations that they've set out here recently, I mean, we got the commentary more bearish and bearish, not least from Governor Waller yesterday saying that there could be some damage under the, quotes, Fed heavy hammer. Uh, so if they were to deliver on that, there could be more losses ahead for bonds. And I think the next level we're watching here for Treasuries is a 3%, as we at MLive have been writing about. Okay. Tatiana, good morning. So that's the big macro story in focus. Uh, another focus is earnings, of course, and we're heading towards the start of the bank earnings story. Many people are watching for clues on the strength or weakness, challenges for consumers. Uh, but you're watching for something else. You're watching LBOs, leverage buyouts. What's the lead in there in terms of the uh, earnings season? Exactly. And so overall, uh, if we look at this, take a step back for the S&P 500, it's expected to be a solid quarter. But for banks particularly, they're expected to have one of the worst quarters. Uh, and that's not least because of the IPO drought, we've seen the M&A slowdown, and as you mentioned, leverage finance. We've seen billions and billions of debt uh, holdings piling up onto their balance sheets. Those are uh, holdings that they have been uh, unable to sell because markets have been roiled by rising interest rate expectations. And here in Europe, we still have the longest uh, junk bond uh, drought since 2011. So uh, even if they start uh, coming and bringing some of that debt uh, onto the market, it's going to take a long time till they can still get rid of that. Okay. Another angle to watch then on the bank earnings story. Tatiana, thank you very much. Tatiana Daria joining us here in London of the Bloomberg Markets Live team. And remember, you can get up-to-date analysis and insights from the Markets Live team. MLIV Go, that is the function to use on your terminal. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>
keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. President Biden has unveiled new federal rules restricting so-called ghost guns. It's a crackdown on purchasers who assemble potentially untraceable weapons from kits. The Biden administration has been criticized for a rise in gun violence during the coronavirus pandemic. Employees at Twitter were scheduled to have yesterday off for the company's monthly day of rest, but Elon Musk made it hard not to think about work. Musk, now the company's largest shareholder, backed away from an offer to join Twitter's board and a company-wide Q&A with him was canceled. Now employees say they are super stressed about trying to figure out what Musk will do next. Coming up, we'll get some clues as to what this bond market will be doing next. Priya Misra, global head of rate strategy at TD Securities, will be joining us. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. European stocks are falling again while U.S. futures fluctuate and the Treasury 10-year yield exceeds 2.8%. Data coming out today may show that March was the high water point for inflation in the U.S. The estimates say consumer prices rose at an annual rate of 8.4%. Ukraine expects Russia to widen its offensive in the eastern part of the country this week. That echoes a U.S. warning, which also predicted a, quote, more protracted and a very bloody phase of the war. Meanwhile, the mayor of Mariupol says that more than 10,000 civilians have died in the city since the invasion. And in China, a sign that COVID lockdowns are taking their toll on production and on spending. Premier Li Keqiang issues a third warning about economic growth risks in less than a week. Li told local officials that China will adopt stronger policies if needed to support the economy. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. And of course, our focus later on in our European trading day, then Matt, is going to be all about that U.S. inflation print. Of course, we won't know till next month whether this is the high, uh, yeah. but certainly an eight handle would catch the market's attention. I mean, I think if we continue to repeat every 10 minutes that this is going to be the peak, we're going to jinx it. <laughs> you know, we don't know if it's going to be the peak. In fact, I spoke with Abigail Doolittle yesterday, who's a chartist. Um, she looks at the technicals, and she said, from that perspective, no, this is not the peak. Right now, um, don't be fooled, by the way, by the little change in S&P futures, because it's a pretty exciting market day. We were down 1.7% yesterday in the cash trade, so not a lot going on here yet, but we had 10-year yields up over 2.8%. They're right about there now, 27956, the highest level we've seen since now the end of 2018. Um, and NYMEX crude coming back from the 4% drop we had yesterday, 97.35 right now. Brent also bouncing back a little bit. And speaking of a bounce back, Bitcoin, it's up. It's only eight tenths of 1%, but at least it's green on the screen, right? 40,177. So maybe that's a risk on indicator. Of course, I'm sure that everyone, Kaylee, is going to be kind of sitting on his hands or her hands until that CPI number comes out. Yep, just about three hours to go. And also everybody is waiting for Bloomberg Crypto later today, 1 p.m. Eastern time. And we'll talk more about Bitcoin, Matt. I also am taking a look at things that are bouncing back in terms of equities moving in pre-market trading. NVIDIA is coming off of a five-day losing streak. It's down 20% over the last five days, but a little bit of reprieve this morning, up about nine-tenths of 1%. Same goes for Tesla. It's down about 8% over the last two sessions, but higher by about six-tenths in early hours this morning. And with that lift in oil that you were talking about, you're seeing a rebound for some of those energy players. The likes of Occidental, which was down more than 6% yesterday, is in the green by 1.5% uh, early on on this Tuesday morning. And then Wells Fargo was actually a stock that was higher yesterday. It was upgraded over uh, at City, but it also uh, is higher this morning, up about half of 1%. Of course, it will be reporting on Thursday, but it's JP Morgan that kicks off those big bank results tomorrow morning, Anna. Yeah, a lot of focus on the earnings story. When you ask investors whether stocks can be resilient in the face of the pace of the rise that we're seeing in yields, uh, a lot of their answers come down to earnings and just how strong that earnings story will be. So we'll focus certainly on that. Uh, the European equity story today is a weak one, though, Kaylee and Matt. We've got the, uh, the Stocks Europe 600 down by around half a percent off earlier lows, but catching up really with the losses we saw on Wall Street yesterday. Commerce Bank and Deutsche Bank both in focus. These two stocks definitely off their earlier lows. They were down by more than 8% in the earlier part of the trade. 
trading day. And this is because one big uh, uh, shareholder is selling a sizable chunk, $2 billion uh, they plan to raise, this investor plans to raise from the sale of shares in, this biz uh, in these businesses. And uh, this follows on from a number of big, ass big uh, sales of this nature that we've seen from the likes of Airbus to Glencore, shareholders offloading large chunks in some of these businesses in recent sessions. The UK 10-year yield also on the rise, just underscoring this global theme, the Treasury theme, but also the global theme about higher rates. Uh, and also drawing a focus to some of the UK data we've had this week, a really tight labour market story here in the in the UK, just as we've seen in the US, uh, but it's slightly different, but uh, similarities. Let's move on and show you the Russian assets right now. That global theme of global equity market sell-off continues to be a feature of the Russian markets as well, down by 2.5% there. Uh, the ruble fairly stable by recent standards, back down to 84. Uh, and uh, this really interesting in the context of some of the comments we got from uh, President Putin earlier about how he does not intend to uh, cut Russia off from the global market markets, but maybe the, the global uh, global players have other ideas, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I think to some extent he controls uh, the exchange rate of the ruble there, as we've spoken about before. Let's talk about the Fed. Governor Christopher Waller is warning about the economic damage that could come from raising interest rates. He spoke at a Fed Listens event yesterday. We do not have a policy rule for every segment of the population. We don't have one for every industry. We have one. It's called the interest rate, the Fed funds rate. That's really it. So it's a very brute force kind of hammer that we use on the economy. And of course, when you kind of have to use a brute force tool, sometimes there's some collateral damage that happens. But we're trying to do this in a way that there's not much of it. But we can't tailor policy. All right, so Christopher Waller talking about the collateral damage that comes from using a hammer. I'm looking at the bear steepening that we've seen over the last few sessions. It's been an amazing move up to, uh, well, 40 basis points, as you can um, see here. Let's bring in Priya Misra, TD Securities Global Head of Rate Strategy, to walk us through the difference between a bear and a bull steepening. Priya, what's, what's, the, uh, what's the difference here and why does it matter? It matters a lot. So, um, so what a bull steepening is, is lower rates led by the front end. A bear steepening is higher rates led by the long end. The reason I think it matters is the economy is actually impacted by longer term rates. I would actually take it one step further and say longer term real rates. And what we've seen over the last few weeks really has been the long end and long end real rates starting to rise. This is what ultimately impacts the mortgage market. This is what impacts the, the, the consumer. This is why I think the market's now getting a little bit overdone. I, I do think that the U.S. 10-year can get to 3%. You know, this is largely due to quantitative tightening. This is also the entire global rate rise. But this is going to tighten financial conditions. This is going to impact the consumer. And this will actually, I think, prevent the Fed from hiking much above neutral. I mean, if you notice, the Fed's been saying we really want to get to neutral. And I think that's the easier call to make right now. By year end, by early next year, the market's pricing well above neutral. That's where your growth slowdown, recession risk starts to come in. Mm. But if the long end, to your point, if we bear steepen, I think the economy starts to slow down much faster than what I think is, is priced in. And that will actually slow down the hiking cycle beyond neutral. Uh, and Priya, tie this into the inflation data that we're going to get out later. If the, if the inflation data is as hot as it is, uh, it, it is uh, expected to be, and if we are going to see tighter financial conditions, are we going to see consumers consumers uh, uh, pulling back? Are we going to see U.S. consumers not able to spend in the way that they have done in recent weeks and therefore putting downward pressure on inflation? Right. So you, you bring up the biggest risk to this entire outlook is if inflation remains extremely high. But I would say we were, you know, we're, uh, we're going to get the CPI number today, but there's also wage inflation. So inflation is a problem for the consumer. But if wage inflation is being able to keep up, then the consumer you know, can, can be more resilient. Now, our view is that wage inflation has been high, but it's going to stall out here. We do think labor force participation is going to rise. So we'll be watching not just CPI, but also wage inflation. Of course, today we get CPI, and I would say as somebody that looks at forecasts, it's notoriously hard to forecast inflation. So there's wide error bands. We think the number is going to stay high. Rent inflation has been extremely high. That tends to be trending. But I think the Fed is responding. I, I, you know, what I worry about is inflation by year end. Will that start to slow down? So do we have a trajectory where the Fed can say, look, inflation's going the right way. It still might be a little bit high, but we really want a soft landing. 
that's the part where I would say today's number is going to be high. But do we see the trajectory? And we're not going to know this today, but you know, in the next few months, do we start to see a trajectory of wage inflation stalling and of CPI putting this high watermark sort of behind us? That'll ease some pressure on the Fed, but it's really hard to know. There's so much going on with uh, with the COVID lockdowns on yeah. on one hand, with the war. So it's unclear whether we actually get that downward trajectory. Priya, I, I want to ask about real yields because right now the 10-year real yield sits at just negative 13 basis points. We have seen a very, very rapid uh, move to the upside. Do you expect that it goes positive and when? So, I, you know, if you look at the 10-year, the you know, it's the front end of, of the real rate curve is sort of pinned extremely low because inflation is that high. So I actually look at five-year, five-year real rates. They are positive. They've gone from very negative to positive territory. That's ultimately telling you that, you know, that's tightening financial conditions. I do think 10-year real rates will move up over time. We do need inflation to put that high mark, watermark behind us. And I think ultimately, I'm, I'm glad you bring that up because really if the ri rise in rates is led all by inflation, expectations, the economy doesn't get as impacted when it's real rate led. And I think these five year, five year real rates closer to 1% is going to really start to hurt the consumer. So there's still a little bit more room in that real rate trade. I think quantitative tightening is ultimately what impacts real rates. That's why we've had this move higher. I do think there's another 20, 30 basis points further increase in that 10 year real rate that uh, that you bring up. On the subject of QT, what does it equate to if it were to be in basis point terms of a hike? Is that like 25 basis points? What number would you put around that? Sure. So I would actually say that it's a nonlinear impact. You know, a lot of the studies suggest that about 700 billion is worth one hike. But, you know, I think it oversimplifies it. The first 700 billion might be worth one hike. I think the second 700 billion could be worth a couple of hikes. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is supply starts to weigh on the market. We keep needing to find the marginal buyer. Who's the marginal buyer for treasuries? We have auctions. We have an auction today. We have auctions three weeks in a month. So I do think there's a non-linearity, particularly as interest rates get to neutral. So by year end, I think that QT starts to have a much bigger impact, which is why I think real rates rise and then that actually slows down Fed hikes. But yeah, there is some equation, but the estimates are actually all over the place, I think, because it depends mm. on how much QT has actually already happened. OK, so finding that marginal buyer becomes uh, maybe more difficult as the Fed continues to step back. Priya, thank you so much for your time. Good to speak to you. Priya Misra joining us there from TD Securities. Thanks for speaking to us here on Bloomberg TV. And coming up on the programme, Rudy Gebekman is a professor of economics at the University of Notre Dame. And we will be speaking to him shortly about uh, expectations for German growth, given energy questions that hang over the economy, but also the global threats around recession. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, Lamborghini Chairman and CEO Stefan Winkelmann. That's at 1.30 p.m. in New York, 6.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. When we look at the current economy and the current economic circumstances, what strikes, uh, what stands out globally is the degree of resilience in the American economic recovery. So we are facing a lot of uncertainty. We're facing uh, rocky waters right now. But the United States is probably better positioned than any other major economy to navigate effectively through them. Why is that? Strong economic growth, strong household balance sheets, a strong American consumer, and an incredibly strong labor market. Brian Deese, U.S. National Economic Council director, speaking with Bloomberg yesterday. Well, a new study says the risk of global recession by the end of the year is rising. According to the Peterson Institute for International Economics, there are a combination of factors, among them the highest inflation in four decades, the war in Europe, and slowing growth in China. Rudiger Bachmann, professor of economics at the University of Notre Dame, joins us now for more. Professor Bachman, let's focus on the war in Europe and Europe, therefore, uh, in particular. You say that an energy embargo would lead to a recession in Europe and particularly in Germany. What about the absence of an energy embargo? Is Europe heading for recession regardless? Um, probably, although so the latest numbers are still positive growth, but uh, often these numbers uh, are a bit sluggish.
the forecasts come in sort of are a bit lagging. So I wouldn't be shocked if it ultimately is a recession. I think it's too early to tell. But in any event, the growth numbers have been um, corrected downward quite a bit. And what if they decide to take a stand against Vladimir Putin and cut off oil and gas imports? Is that then um, inevitably going to, lead, going to lead to a recession for Germany and the rest of Europe? Yes, that will lead to a recession and will lead to a severe recession, in fact. So I and others have looked at this. There are now a number of studies out there. Um, and we are talking anywhere from, say, minus 1% to minus 6%, so a really severe corona-type recession, if you will. Is it, are there ways to, um, you know, help uh, dampen those negative effects, Professor, um, that Germany could take? Otherwise, maybe it's not worth it, I guess, to take that stand if you're shooting yourself in the foot at the same time. Well, but it's a question whether this is really a, a, a shot in the foot, right? So there are, and there are, indeed economic policy measures you can take. And uh, some of it comes out of straight out of the corona playbook. Uh, we know how to do uh, uh, protection umbrellas around affected industries. Um, we know how to do short-term work programs so we can avoid mass unemployment. So how bad it's going to be is indeed uh, a function of good economic policy. That's a mixture of getting more gas supply, which the current German government at least is doing very well, but also cutting down on gas demand, which I don't think they are doing very well. Quite the contrary, they are subsidizing uh, energy prices right now, or that's where the economic policy packages are heading. I think that is uh, actually a recipe for disaster. And then, you know, should it actually come to uh, an embargo, you need these uh, protection programs for industry and workers. And then, um, in addition, you also need a monetary policy that kind of will uh, fight the inflation coming out of this. So if it's a mixture of policies, also social policies, to avoid social unrest, I think it can be handled the way we handled the corona recession, which did not lead to an economic calamity, although on the books it was a pretty severe recession. Uh, Professor Bachmann, good morning. Uh, you, you talk about a range of outcomes for the German economy. If we did see an embargo on Russian, on all Russian energy, ranging from a recession of minus 1% to minus 6%, what is it that dictates whether, uh, uh, which end of that, uh, that spectrum we end up? Well, partially, I think uh, the quality of the economic policy and, uh, you know, partially, I mean, this. so why did we, why do we have such a big range? This is not a normal times where you can do sort of your normal business cycle forecasting. And the studies I've seen are not attempting to do sort of your standard business cycle forecasting. They're, the studies are there to get an order of magnitude. Are we talking about a an economic calamity, the way the German government is painting it right now, the way, for example, we have seen it for Greece, Greece had a minus 20% uh, uh, percent, uh, GDP reduction um, through the austerity policy. Are we talking about economic calamities at that, of that order of magnitude? Or are we talking about something in the single digits? And I've not seen a study that goes beyond the single digits. And I don't think we can do more, quite frankly, as an economics profession, given the, the high level of uncertainty. Um, and I'm not even talking about mm. China right now, um, where we have sort of a second uh, uh, crisis center with China's yes. uh, uh, Omicron uh, problem. Yes, and let me ask you about that, because at a global level, are you expecting to see a recession? Kaylee started this conversation with you, citing some research from, another, uh, from, uh, from other economists that talks about how that, that prospect is, is rising. But for many, they say, look, we're going to see a, a slowdown in growth, because growth has still been re rebounding from COVID lows. Uh, but we're not going to see global recession. How does China play into that calculus? I think China is a major danger for the global economy right now. And I think it's mm. frankly underestimated. And it goes in both ways. It, it, it will lead to a renewal of the supply chain disruptions and it will contribute to uh, already high and rising inflation. So I'm not, you know, I'm not in the business of uh, actually business cycle forecasting. You have uh, people on Wall Street and in London in the city to do this. Yep. Quant out, uh, the quant shops to do this forecasting, but I think we see a severe, severe uh, danger of a recession combined with well, high inflation. Professor, we're watching with alarm the uh, developments in Sri Lanka. There was uh, unrest, first riots around the palace. Now, um, 
they're going to default because they don't have enough dollars to pay for food and fuel. Is this the kind of situation that could spread? It may very well be. After all, we are in a major war right now. And, and uh, you know, wars are just never good times. And so wars beget crises around the globe. And uh, we still aren't really out of the global pandemic, I think. If, you know, um, what, one sixth, one seventh of the world population is still basically under a major threat of the global pandemic, then we aren't out of it. So you have a war, a, a, a war, a major war combined with a global pandemic. I don't know what what else that is other than the mother of all crises. Uh, professor Bachman, thank you very much for your time. Rudiger Bachman, uh, University of Notre Dame, uh, Professor of Economics, thank you very much for joining us. Coming up on Balance of Power later today, U.S. Council of Economic uh, Advisors member Heather Bausche. That's at 12.30 p.m. in New York, 5.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lines in New York. Anna Edwards is with us out of London. Now, Tom Keane, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, joins us to talk about um, typically his single best chart. Tom, I guess you're going to be focused in on the fixed income uh, market because it's so fascinating to watch what's well, going on with spreads, with uh, <clears throat> real yields. and. Yeah the possibility of the end of the bull market. And you guys have done a great job in the last hour. I've stole this from The Economist, one D burger. Let's look at the burger chart, folks. It's very simple. This is the chart the pros are looking at. Danny Berger featured it earlier. Matt Miller stole it from Danny Berger, and I'm stealing it from <laughs> Matt Miller. This is the acclaimed H15 series, which goes back to Eisenhower, up to the Volcker inflation, and down we go in the great moderation. It's a log chart, log y-axis, slope matters, percent change, and what you need to know on a standard deviation basis, those circles down there, we have moved from negative 4.7 off the trend to plus 2.5. Matt, I mm. have never seen that in my lifetime. It's pretty amazing. And you're going to be what? Well, I just. And you're going to watch how these 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 bond markets respond then to the inflation data later on, uh, uh, Tom. Which of the guests you've got coming up that, that, that you think uh, worthy of mention? Well, if there's any number to talk to, I think Seth Carpenter will have a global view on this with Morgan Stanley, and of course he's working off the good work of Alan Zentner. But as Matt mentioned earlier, Anna, it's it's extraordinary what we're seeing here. What I do is I call this convexity. It is the acceleration that is there. It is the rate of change which is there, which is giving everyone in the game pause. Yeah, it's really the rate of change that I think is is uh, freaking out markets to some extent. Tom Keen, their co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. Thanks very much. Look forward to the program. Uh, of course, we are focused on inflation today and the CPI coming out in just about um, two and a half hours from now. I'm watching it very closely. You know, at the top of the hour, we got headlines from the Biden administration. They're going to allow the sale of higher ethanol gas mm. in a bid to ease costs at the pump. And um, maybe that's good for your wallet, but not so great for your engine. So inflation and all its dynamics very much in focus as we work our way through this uh, this trading day. European equity markets off their earlier lows, but still negative. U.S. futures fairly flat. Nasdaq futures actually bouncing a little bit this hour. Bloomberg surveillance more follows. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>